I actually don't have as many props as people yesterday, uh, much to your dismay, uh, which, is a, which is a shame because if there's one author who can be sort of displayed visually, I think it is Jones. Um, but I did bring with this apple, which they had this morning at my hotel, and I was thinking um, at the end of The Thin Red Line, there's the great scene where James Jones, the character is probably James Jones, holds up an apple at the end as the soldiers walk by him. He's at the end of the novel, and he holds up this apple, and he's looking at it, and all the soldiers are streaming by. And it's kind of, I think it's supposed to be the symbol of knowledge for Jones, or maybe some sort of eternal truth, the Garden Eden, I don't know. But, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't profess to have any, you know, lingering knowledge about Jones. I'm sort of new to his work and his scholarship. But uh, just the same, I, I want to give a talk a little bit about, um, I was going to speak originally about Jones in the era of postmodernism, but I've changed my topic a little bit, especially after hearing Chris speak yesterday. Um, and given what seems like the common disdain for postmodernism <laughs> here, I'll, uh, I'm actually going to focus on the theme of Jones as a war writer, whether or not he really was a so-called war writer. In James Jones, an American literary orientalist master, Stephen Carter gives an overview of James Jones's critical reception. Basically, Carter says, Jones was never really respected as a, quote, civilian author. His accolades came as a war writer. And the evidence would obviously support that, given that a number of his so-called domestic novels were more or less trounced by the critics, uh, especially Some Came Running, which Granville Hicks, the famous critic, called a, quote, monstrosity. And recently, there's been something of a resurgence in James Jones's literary appraisal, even his domestic writing. Willie Morris called Some Came Running one of the great neglected masterpieces of American literature. And last night, William Groom said he would put it up against any of the works of Jones's generation. And um, writers from Styron and Shaw to Mailer and Didion have all sounded off about Jones's prowess as a writer. Uh, even the critics have started to take note with two praiseworthy biographies coming out in the 1980s, uh, Garrett's and McShane's. And now, Stephen Carter's study of the transcendentalism in Jones's work. Um, to some extent, the movies have helped that resurgence. I, for one, only became aware of Jones's work after watching the marvelous film by Terrence Malick. And I, I know the jury's still out on that film, but I, for one, loved it. Though I confess I hadn't seen the original at that point, let alone read Jones's novel at that point. In the last half decade, several pieces have been published on Jones's fiction including works by critics outside the field of literary studies and in such disparate areas as film theory, military history, political science, and even philosophy. And this is in addition, of course, to all the literary work being done on Jones, in which this conference will hopefully help contribute to. Um, of course, Jones still gets little of the critical acclaim he deserves. And part of that might be because he's often thought of as a, quote, war writer, or worse yet, a popular author, although he isn't quite you know, J.K. Rowling's, yeah, but someday. That he's popular now is hard to dispute. My guess is that as younger generations come back from war, his work will take on added resonance and meaning. And that, that he's topical nowadays is, um, or actually, uh, that Jones is topical nowadays is the subject I had intended to speak about, especially what his realism means in the age of postmodernism. But I think that's a fairly simple point to make. Um, James Jones writes war in a way that few authors have, either then or now, and that is simply and directly. He has no roundabout style, and his main concern is the human psyche or the individual reactions of soldiers, not the narrative structuring, the role of the author, or the question of what a book does or how it works or any of the other issues that would become hallmarks of postmodern war fiction, especially in writers like Pynchon, O'Brien, and Heller. But more important, writers like Pynchon and O'Brien and Heller aren't even considered war novelists. They're just novelists. Perhaps that's because they did do innovative things with language and narrative, rather than just try and tell the plain truth, as Jones saw it. Though O'Brien and Pynchon especially would say that truth is contained in the very medium of their expression, what they would call their self-reflexive narratives, and which Winston Groom, I think, called bullshit last night. But regardless, there's a debate still on um, the best way to sort of explain war, express it. And I think the postmodern camp is very different from Jones's approach, but there's a question about which is more authentic there. Regardless, the point I, I wish to make is a fairly simple one, that James Jones was not a, quote, war writer. To the extent that war became a subject in his fiction, and in particular the thin red line, it's mainly as a scene or a backdrop. What's more important than the combat or any of the depictions of it is the way his soldiers react to it and how they're haunted by it throughout 
haunted throughout by memories of their home lives, in some cases propelled by them. In fact, images of home life are rampant in Jones's texts, such that no easy distinction can be drawn between the domestic setting and the foreign. War for Jones is an all-encompassing experience, one in continuous overlap with civilian life. And to see him as a war writer, as many critics did and still do, is to miss a fundamental point in his fiction, as well as a central truth about combat. And that is that there are no, quote, soldiers on the battlefield. War is composed of civilians, inundated with the same senses and impressions as anybody, albeit in a more drastic setting. And to relegate Jones, let alone his characters, to the status of war-themed is, I think, to overlook their basic humanness, as well as his task as an author. Interestingly enough, Jones never really distinguished between his civilian work and his wartime writings. For him, the two were inextricably linked. And for example, when he was holed up in a hospital, when he, after he was recently evacuated from Guadalcanal, he wrote a long poem, which he called The, Ki the Hill They Call the Horses. Um, he would later come back to a number of the scenes in this poem, especially the dead he keeps dreaming of in the poem, including the guy he probably killed at Guadalcanal. And he would turn these little figments into the book that became The Fitter and Latin. It's actually really interesting, if you're interested in Jones's life, to see how he sort of changed this poem into eventually what became, I think, his novel, and probably his most autobiographical one, too. Um, but one of more, the more notable sections in the poem is when Jones talks about time and what it means for him as he's recovering in a hospital, especially from his injury. And he writes, quote, I am a stranger here. I do not know this place. I am of the tortured past the so conveniently forgotten past. And in the, this present of the future, the past is out of place. And you can see the collapsing of memories here, the images that Jones draws in the poem, very Owen-esque in their depiction of the dead skulls and how they've made their way out of the battlefields and literally onto his bed sheets as he's recovering in the hospital. Of course, the thin red line itself contains numerous such flashbacks, possibly even flash forwards many of them pre-war, including memories of loved ones, relationships with fathers, even Sergeant Welsh's recollection of a football game, in which prompts him, rather absurdly, to start passing out hand grenades as if he were hitting his wide receivers with footballs. Uh, one of the most powerful moments in the novel, which was left out of the film versions, is when Private Bell sees the wounded laid out on the front, and he recalls himself masturbating as a child. It was the great critic Paul Fussell probably the dean of modern war fiction criticism, who wrote in The Great War and Modern Memory that such moments are what make Jones's fiction what they are. And those are the ones that really do encapsulate, encapsulate the wartime experience. Um, Fussell himself was a Marine Corps officer in the Pacific Campaign, same time as Jones. And he was wounded, like Jones, a couple days into battle and found himself sidelined for the rest of it. I actually had the chance to meet Paul Fussell last November when he was speaking at the Humanities Festival in Chicago. I don't know if any of you were there, but it was a really wonderful festival on war writing at this time. Um, and he was giving a talk there on the current Iraq war. This is Fussell and what a hopeless mess it had become along the lines of Vietnam. And uh, Fussell's talk was followed by a forum with other writers, including Philip Caputo, Jack Fuller, Larry Heineman, and Robert Owen Butler. Uh, between the sessions, I went over and spoke with Fussell, introducing myself to him then. He was nearing 70, but he still had that gait of an officer, which I, I think that whole generation carries with them now. But I, I introduced myself to him as just coming, having come back from the war in the Middle East, which I had at that point. And I told him that I was also studying English and greatly inspired by what he had written. Being fussel, he kind of shrugged off the praise and, and nodded. But I asked him a question, and that was why he'd chosen to study literature or write about it professionally. 